CSM is giving you free courses. That's right, free courses each month just for being part of the NASM family. Learn about everything ranging from nutrition to strength, weight loss to stress relief, and everything in between. Click the link in the bio for information and to claim your free course before they're gone. You are listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and I want to tell you a little story before I get talking about what our topic is. Wow, that's not true. Let me tell you what the topic is. Today, we're going to talk about scapular movement. We're gonna talk about how the scapula moves. What are some of the issues that we tend to see? What are the muscles that create the joint actions? And uh, we'll talk about common scapular movement dysfunctions. And then maybe just gently address some of the ways to address those with your clients. But uh, it all started for me when I didn't know I had shoulder dysfunction. Well, I knew I had a little, uh, a little rotator cuff issue that happened when I was a sophomore in college. But one day I was at the gym and uh, I was in the, the changing room and I was taking my shirt off. And when I, when I put my arms back down from being over my head, one of the trainers was like, whoa, that was crazy. And I was like, I know I'm jacked, right? And he was like, no, <laughs> that's, that's not what I'm talking about. He goes, you were jacked up. Do that again. Put your arms over your head. So I put my arms over my head. And he said, okay, put your arms down. And I put my arms down and he goes, whoa. And so he's looking at me from behind posterior. And I'm like, what? What's happening? And he was like, man, you put your arms overhead. And when you bring your arms down, your shoulder blades basically drop down and smack each other. It was like they run after each other, like there was some kibble that was just thrown down and the dogs are jumping after the bowl. They just smack into each other. And I was like, that doesn't even make any sense. And this happened years ago, so not, like we didn't have phones with cameras on them that you could easily actually see or picture what was happening. So I'm trying to go to a mirror and put my arms up and lower them back down. As he pointed it out, I started noticing how it felt. Now, it didn't feel unusual because that's just what my arms feel like when I put my arms down. So I went to physical therapy and I had my shoulders looked at. So let me tell you what happened. I put my arms down and those shoulder blades, when they would go, they'd go in the upward rotation fine, but they would drop into downward rotation, they weren't decelerated into downward rotation. So the muscles responsible for decelerating downward rotation of my scapula were not participating in the movement. They didn't let that happen. So think about what that would look like while I'm doing an overhead press and all the muscles that are not supporting me in that process. One of the other things that we know about shoulders is that the uh, we tend to be stuck in downward rotation. We are limited in our ability to go into upward rotation. So if it's limiting my ability to take my arm overhead because the same muscles that are supposed to support me in lowering downward rotation, decelerating downward rotation, are also the ones that accelerate upward rotation of the scapula. All right. What if you're listening to this, you have no idea what I'm talking about. What, what is upward and downward rotation of the scapula? Let's start here. Let's start with scapular movements. We're not gonna start with upward and downward rotation. We're gonna finish with that one. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to uh, shrug. Shrug your shoulders up towards your ears. Shrugging the shoulders up towards your ears. All right, that is called scapular elevation. When you lower them back down, it's scapular depression. What muscles then? are responsible for scapular elevation? Well, we'll name a couple. One, and the easy answer is the upper traps. So we we know like if we're shrugging and we're doing exercises, that exercise specifically, we'd think, all right, that's good upper trap exercise, shrugging the shoulders. Well, there's another muscle that literally has that joint action in its name. And that muscle is the levator scapula. So it is the muscle that elevates the scapula, the levator lifting the scapula. So levator scapula and upper traps are gonna be your, um, your elevators. They are the, your shrugging muscles. Well, 
here's the thing. When we do exercises, we tend to like to shrug. So things like the upper traps and the levator like to jump in and have us do uh, this elevation as opposed to maybe retraction or maintaining a neutral position or depressed position in the scapula. So let's talk about some of the issues that we see. Like, so I might have people doing a row, right? And they're doing rowing exercises or even a lat pull down exercise. And as they pull down, it's like their shoulder blades, instead of depressing and going down, they shrug, they go up. Now that would be something that we would call um, a, a dysfunctional movement pattern. And again, it's not wrong, but it can lead to, to dysfunction in your movement. So I don't like necessarily to always point out, this is what's wrong, but uh, it's not particularly wrong. But what it shows is an imbalance where the muscles that do the opposite of elevation, which are the muscles that do depression, those muscles are going to be muscles like the lower traps. What muscles do depression? Lower traps. That's a muscle that does depression. All right. Nobody talks about how jacked their lower traps look. Nobody's like, oh, let me get my lower trap work in today. Doesn't happen very often. Also, the pec minor is a depressor. Here's what's interesting and also problematic. The pec minor is usually better at it than the lower traps. So when people do depress, they like to protract and jet their shoulder blades forward and get in this protracted position. So then we see people rowing or doing lap pull downs, sometimes even pressing, and they might elevate. So we cue them out of it, and then they protract because the pec minor has those two joint actions. So let's go through our joint actions again. We have elevation of the scapula, upper traps, and levator scapula depression of the scapula, lower traps, and pec minor. There are other muscles that can participate in it, but these are the ones that I want you to think about that focus on uh, cleaner, better movement, and also can dis uh, get into a little dysfunctional patterns because your lats have the, the propensity to be a depressor. It's just they don't do that very well, um, uh, depending on your position. And then your pecs can assist with that as well. But we're looking at primarily the lower traps, depressing the scapula, and the pec minor. All right, so elevation and depression. It's two joint actions. Let's move into the next one. The next one, let's talk about protraction. Protraction is that rounded shoulder. So if you take your shoulders and you retract, that means you're pulling your shoulder blades together. You're squeezing your shoulder blades back. Protraction is rounding them forward. So think of the computer position where I've got this kind of stereotypical forward head position, internally rotated shoulders, my back is hunched, and my shoulder blades are protracted. I'm protracted. So here we are stuck in protraction. And there are two primary muscles that are going to do that at the scapula. It's going to be the serratus anterior and the pec minor. But here's the problem. The pec minor is that muscle, it's like, <laughs> the pec minor is like the TFL of the upper body, right? So TFL likes to jump in, get its hands into everything it can, and becomes really hypertonic and overactive. It might even be weak, but it's still trying to participate in everything. So pec minor is gonna look like that as well. Pec minor is trying to jump in there. It can do protraction, it's gonna try to do it. It can do downward rotation, it's gonna try to do it. It's gonna stick in you into those positions and overtake. So what happens is I have a serratus anterior that should be a protractor and the pec minor starts to go, you know what, it's cool, I got it. And so as the pec minor does a little bit more, and the serratus anterior is not responsible for work, the serratus anterior starts to back off. And it says, oh, that's all right. If you want to do it, you can do it. And then the pec minor gets stronger, serratus anterior gets weaker. And so you have these synergistic muscles that are supposed to be working together. And then it turns into, you know the word, synergistic dominance. So that synergistic effect starts to move into one of those muscles becoming more dominant in that particular exercise. All right, so that is protraction. What about retraction? Retraction, we'll talk about the rhomboids being retractors and our mid traps being retractors. So our rhomboids and our mid traps. Sometimes, and this is interesting, sometimes people are stuck in protraction and they feel really tight in between their shoulder blades. So people are stuck in this office back position 
and they feel that rounded position and they're like, oh my gosh, in between my shoulder blades, it feels so tight. And they might even try to stretch that and it may feel better momentarily. But the problem is, is that those muscles are being lengthened, but they're also activated. Those muscles are lengthened and overactive in these positions where not that they're overactive enough to bring it back to a neutral position, it's just that they're eccentrically active and so they are fired up. And so it's not really about lengthening those, it's about finding balance in our position to give strength to those posterior muscles. So protraction, serratus or serratus anterior and our pec minor, retraction, rhomboids and our mid traps, all right? So we did elevation, depression, protraction, retraction. Let's move now to the upward and downward rotation that the story began on, an upward rotation. Here's what happens. When you take your arm over your head, that's not just an arm movement. That's not just abduction of the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint. That also requires that your scapula, and if you're watching, you can see my hands. So this is elevation, this is depression, this is protraction, retraction, but here we go. Upward rotation looks like this. So my hands, as I hold them in front of me and I'm turning my elbows up towards the ceiling, my hands rotate. And then I bring it back down, that's downward rotation. So as I reach overhead, like a shoulder press, it's not just my arm moving over, but it is the scapula rotating, allowing that movement to happen. And there's three muscles primarily that do that. The serratus anterior. So that's gonna be one of your primary upward rotators. And this one I find to be, these two to be really interesting because they're the same muscle and they're different locations. So we've got upper traps and lower traps. Now the upper traps will elevate, lower traps depress, but here they work concurrently to do upward rotation of the scapula. Upward rotation of the scapula. So the lower traps pull down on the medial border of the scapula, which creates upward rotation. And the upper traps pull up on the lateral border of the scapula creating upward rotation. So they work synergistically with the serratus anterior in order to create that movement, all right? Well, what does downward rotation? So for instance, I'm doing a lat pull down. I need to do downward rotation in order to get that down. So what are some of the muscles that do downward rotation? Well, your levator scapula is a downward rotator. Your rhomboids are downward rotators. And your pec minor, there's the pec minor again. Man, the pec minor again. So the pec minor does downward rotations. And I'll even throw in like the lats have the ability to assist with downward rotation because they insert at the inferior angle of the scapula. So they have some effect on that downward rotation of the scapula as well. But your primary muscles that you're looking at that are working as force couples for downward rotation, levator scapula, rhomboids, and pec minor. So let's go through it again. Upward rotation, serratus anterior, upper trap, lower trap. Downward rotation, levator scapula, rhomboids, pec minor. All right, so let's talk about issues with certain joint actions. And then we'll talk about these issues and how they can be addressed a little bit. So for instance, let's talk about elevation in multiple movements, right? So I'm doing a row and you see me go into elevation. So I shrug when I do a row. One of the reasons that might happen is because your upper trap seems to be more capable than your mid traps and your rhomboids. So it's easier to shrug than it is to retract. So one of the things you may want to do is you may wanna do like a upper trap release and levator scapula release that are doing the shrugging. Uh, or, I mean, honestly, the first thing you might want to do is simply cue your clients out of it, right? We, we get a little corrective exercise happy sometimes rather than just saying, hey, drop your shoulder blades back. What's another good cue? See if you can get your, uh, your scapula. Try to drop them down into your back pockets. Just some cues for people to hear. I need to hear what you need me to do. So drop those shoulder blades down into the back pocket. Um, some people say, I don't know if I'm shrugging. Then you say, shrug and they shrug, and then you say, now get out of your shrug, and they drop it all the way down, and you go, that is what I want, that. 
And so having them go further into the dysfunction and then having them pull out of that and then say, okay, that's the position I want you to be in. Sometimes that one can be very, very helpful for people. All right, so now they're shrugging and they might do that if you're doing rows and say you're shrugging and they say, I don't know what that means. Just say, hey, shrug and get in front of them so they can see you shrug like this and they do that and they don't go up very far. And then you're in front of them and you say, now drop your shoulder blades down like this. And you're giving them the visual and they drop their shoulder blades down and say, now, when you retract, try to maintain that position. When you row back, try to maintain that position. We see it a lot with pushing too. So like a cable chest press or a banded chest press, people start pushing and they go into an elevation. So we want to cue them out of that. But we also need to understand that we need to strengthen those depressing muscles. Well, what are those muscles that help to depress the scapula? Those are going to be muscles primarily like the, the, the lower traps are focus on that one, getting that muscle to engage because otherwise the upper trap likes to take over. All right. Protraction and rounded shoulders. Now, Rick, you said that straightest anterior is part of the protraction. And you say we're stuck a lot of times in protraction. So the straightest anterior is overactive. I'm going to tell you right now, probably never ever in any client you ever meet will the serratus anterior be overactive. It's most likely a, uh, a pec minor is going to be a huge contributor to that. So pec minor is going to be a huge contributor to that. It likes to protract us. It likes to shorten and, uh, and control what's going on at the scapula a lot more than some of these other muscles. So. When we look at this, if I want to engage my serratus anterior more, I need to protract, but I need to be in a position where the pec minor is not going to jump in and try to help. So how do I do that? We do it through something called reciprocal inhibition. I need to do a joint action that my pec minor is lengthened in. So if I'm going to protract, which the pec minor will participate in, I need to get it out of a movement that it does that it, it's not shortened in. So for instance, the serratus anterior does upward rotation of the scapula, pec minor does downward rotation of the scapula. So if I want to focus on serratus anterior activation over pec minor activation, I'll go into upward rotation of the scapula and then practice my protractions. So what we're doing is we're reciprocally inhibiting the pec minor by going into upward rotation, and we're preferentially activating the serratus anterior. And that's how we work on focusing that exercise. What you will want to do beforehand is now go through the corrective exercise continuum with the pec minor. Let's do some release on it. You can use um, a tennis ball or uh, some type of trigger point ball or a, a cane or, you know, the the loop de lose all the all the inhibitory tools that are out there inhibit and then do what stretch well when you stretch the pec minor one of the things it's a pec stretch which you can do but remember if you go into a little more abduction so take the arm over the head a little bit more when you do your bent arm pec stretch against a wall or in a door frame something like that just Go into the arm a little bit overhead, the hand a little bit overhead, because what that does is that now, because the pec's a downward rotator, we're going into upward rotation, so it stretches the pec. Now you're going into this retraction by pushing into that pec stretch, and so it's stretching out that protractor in two of those joint actions, in two of those planes of motion. It's, uh, it's lengthening in upward rotation, it's lengthening in retraction of the scapula. So you stretch the pec and then your serratus anterior activations are going to be better because your pec minor is not going to be like, ooh, I'll do it. Ooh, let me in. Oh, I got it. Hey, no, guys, don't worry about it. Let me get in there. Finally, we're trying to... That was a blow dart with a tranquilizer tip on it. That's basically what we're trying to do. It's we're trying to trank the pec minor, get it to calm down, stop jumping in on everything, and now your serratus anterior has a chance to activate. All right. So I can now start working protraction by getting my serratus anterior to activate. 
All right, cool. That's a, that's a good touch. Uh, what about scapular winging? That's another thing that we've heard of. You have the scapular winging. If you get into a push-up position or a uh, plank position and you see people and they're in that position and their scapula, they look like they're winging. So the medial border of the scapula starts to come up off of the rib cage. And it's almost like a, those gargoyles where the wings are just popping right out of it. So now gargoyle back, we're gonna try to figure out how do we get out of scapular winging? What causes scapular winging? What's well, weakness in, guess what? The serratus or serratus anterior. So that muscle, that's a muscle that we know is commonly weak and underactive but we see it being weak and underactive in several positions. I can't maintain my plank position or my push-up position without the scapula lifting up off of the, the, the rib cage. So what do we do? Well, we find muscles that do the opposite of that. So what are some of the muscles that, um, or, or that cause the winging? One of them is going to be the pec minor. My goodness, the pec minor keeps coming in as like the, I don't want you to think of like a naughty muscle. It's just like, hey guys, I'm just trying to help out. And the serratus anterior is like, hey guys, if y'all want to do it, then I'll just kick back. So we need to get the pec minor to calm down. We need the serratus anterior to, to jump in there and start participating a little bit more. And that will help to pull the medial border of the scapula back on top of the rib cage. And the other muscles that will assist with that will be the rhomboids in the mid and lower traps are gonna support in that process as well for scapular winging. All right, let's go one more exercise or one more joint action and it's what we started off with and that is upward rotation and downward rotation. So again, uh, if I go into upward rotation, sometimes we don't have a lot of range of motion in that. So overhead athletes, um, people that get pinching or an impingement in their shoulder when they reach overhead, it's probably because their downward rotators are too hyperactive. They're a little too tonic. They're firing up a little too much. And so the muscles that take me into upward rotation now have to fight against the muscles that are trying to keep me in downward rotation. They are trying to decelerate my upward rotation. So what am I looking at here that I might want to do? Um, maybe some inhibitory techniques and lengthening techniques on so I can be better at my overhead movement. And those are going to be the, the muscles that do downward rotation. So I might say, hey, let's get the, the cane or something that we can press into the levator scap. So the levator scapula, let's get a release on that. Rhomboids, would be another muscle that helps stick you into downward rotation. So that would be like a nice little foam roll uh, going across your mid back and just rolling across the rhomboids, maybe get them to calm down. I would say out of the three muscles, rhomboids are my least concern that are trying to get you in downward rotation because these muscles, um, as we've seen, they are retractors also. And so they're usually not firing as well as they should, but levator scapula, it's an elevator. Remember that muscle always like to be like, yo, let me get in on that. Um, and then the pec minor. And I'd say the, the, the levator scapula and the pec minor also do something called anterior tipping of the scapula. And so what happens, it's kind of like a judo hip throw. We've got the levator lifting, lifting the person up like that. And then the pec minor flipping it over. So it is elevating our scapula and then the pec minor is pulling that scapula forward and it is creating this elevation, this protraction, this anterior tipping. It can support winging of the scapula. So we're gonna have you then say, all right, let's, let's inhibit levator scap and let's inhibit pec minor. Let's then stretch those muscles. When those muscles stretched, then let's do an activation for the serratus anterior and maybe the lower traps. Why? Because the upper traps, who is the other rotator, remember upper traps, serratus anterior, lower traps are all upward rotators. Which one probably doesn't need the extra activation? Upper traps, good. Let's pull that out and let's focus on lower trap activation, serratus anterior activation. Now, if you follow the corrective exercise continuum, we've done our inhibit, we've done our lengthen, we've done our activation. But as you know, None of that matters 
unless you integrate it together. I've taken out the flutes to focus on the flutes. I've taken out the clarinets and the trombones. Everybody just kind of focus on that. And now we have to put you back in as an orchestra in order to learn to play together. So for those those of you out there who are just going, oh, I just like to, I like the foam rolling, I like the stretching, but I don't really do activations. And some people are like, oh, I just like the activations. And then we get ready right into our workouts. And it, it's a it's a continuum. So that inhibit, that lengthen, that activation, and then not just jump into your workouts, then practice moving through a full range of motion, getting the muscles that were overactive to learn to allow that range of motion to take place, get the muscles that weren't helping go through that range of motion, the primary movers or the force couples that work in this joint action, get them to be in the conversation and say, hey, we are now working together to create, in this instance, upward rotation of the scapula and decelerate, in my case in particular, downward rotation of the scapula. And so now can I downward rotate my scapula instead of just having them drop and collapse and smack into each other? Fortunately, yes. Yes, I can control that. It works much better now after a little bit of time in physical therapy. And here's the other frustrating thing. I remember the physical therapist say, hey, try to feel this muscle working. It was in my serratus interior. And I have to tell you, when you cue people to feel muscles and they can't get those muscles to activate, sometimes that could be really frustrating because... I don't know what it feels like because I can't, I don't have a conversation with that muscle at all. I don't know how to get that muscle to work at all. I used to feel the same way because my flat feet and my weak feet and people would say, do a short foot, try to get your muscles to work, feel the muscles, create an arch. I didn't have a clue what any of that meant because I've never had an arch. I've never requested that movement from my feet. Now it's a little bit different after years of trying to have these conversations and slowly building up these neural patterns and encoding these movements. And is my movement the best? Do I have the best movement out there? I mean, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. I'm just kidding. It's not that good. There are things that I still work on. And my scapular movement, one of those things that I still work on regularly. I understand today is pretty complicated. Listening to this, watching this, trying to absorb all of this can be really challenging. So what I'm gonna do just one more time, I'm gonna go through all the joint actions and the muscles that support that. So just stick with me one more time. We've got elevation, it's gonna be the upper traps and levator scapula, depression. And we're gonna think primarily depression is gonna be your lower traps. And that's the one I want you to focus on because we need to build strength in depression and lower traps is the way to play with that one. What muscles do? Protraction. Think about it before I say it. Pec minor, what's the other one important? Serratus anterior. What does retraction? You probably know this because you've cued so many people into it. Even if you're not a personal trainer yet, you probably say squeeze those shoulder blades together. Squeeze those mid traps and rhomboids. We say that a lot, mid traps and rhomboids to do retraction. All right, upward and downward rotation. Upward rotation, upper trap, lower trap, serratus anterior. What does upward rotation, one more time, upper trap, lower trap, serratus anterior. What does downward rotation? Downward rotation is levator scapula, your pec minor, and your rhomboids will assist from that. So again, downward rotation, upper traps, rhomboids, pec minor. Okay. All right. I hope that for those of you who are new to this, that you didn't just listen to the first couple of minutes and just be like, I can't, I just can't. I know these little words, 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 all these words. So it's a lot of words, but it's learning the language. And people ask me a lot of times, like, how do you know these things? How do you remember these things? I remember them because I teach them. Like if I just learned this in school, it would be very difficult for me to remember all of this because I don't teach my clients this. But also as a corrective exercise specialist, it's much easier for me to remember because I have to immediately look at and be like, oh, there's some issues with going into upward rotation. I need to look at the downward rotators and I need to get them back off. And then I need to strengthen some of the muscles that do upward rotation. 
and get them to activate more and then start to integrate movement together so that it becomes much smoother, much smoother, less pinching, more comfortable. All right, I hope you found this interesting. Hope you found it supportive. And for those of you who are taking the test, uh, you, you may find this very helpful because sometimes we teach things and I'm not teaching any of this stuff to help you pass the test, but it may in fact support you in the process. And if that's the case, fantastic. I wish you the best in your upcoming examinations. And for those of you who are learning this or listening to this for learning's sake, Many of you, this is going to be a refresher for many of you. It's going to help to clarify things. So I hope that you found it helpful. Also, I'm going to address one more thing. For those of you who are watching, uh, you probably see my eye. Huh? Yeah, so it's um, allergy season right now. I went, uh, I'm recording this, and I went to uh, itchy eye, to scratch my eye, to now bloodshot eye. So if you're watching this the whole time, you're like, Ew, <laughs> what's going on with old bloody eye Rick over there? Uh, now you at least know that it's uh, allergy season. And in New York, I know you think it's just a bunch of big buildings and there's no uh, vegetation around at all. I, I thought that too, but man, something's blooming and it's getting the best of me. So I uh, hope you guys are feeling well, staying safe and your allergies out there are under control. Thank you for taking time to listen to the podcast. I appreciate it. If you want to reach out to me, you can do so on social media where I'm most active is Instagram at dr.rickrichie, R-I-C-H-E-Y, or you can email me rick.richie at nasm.org. If you have questions, you got a topic that you would like to be discussed to learn a little bit more about, feel free to reach out to me, talk to me. Thank you so much. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.